So this is why I'm here. This is a DNA sequence. This is a DNA sequence of a particular gene in a fly, and it's what got me interested in all this. Uh, this particular gene is called dunce, because when it's mutated, the poor old fly finds it rather difficult to learn and remember things. So this is a gene associated with learning and memory, and in fact, we all have a very similar gene, and it seems perhaps to be doing rather similar things in us as well. And in 1976, this mutation was discovered. We didn't know anything about its DNA sequence. The, de the mutation was discovered, and I decided that's what I wanted to study. That's what I wanted to use. You wanted to use flies to try and understand the links between genes and behavior. Now, what I'm going to do today is to try and explain how we got here in terms of turning a mutation, this behavior, this fly that can't learn, into a set of letters, a set of A's and T's and C's and G's, how we understood what was in a gene. And we can actually date that. We can date when it actually began. And it began on Saturday, the 30th of May, 1953. And I think that is the moment when modern biology began. And it took place in a Nature article published by Watson and Crick. And it's not the Nature article you're thinking about. That was published six weeks earlier. Six weeks earlier, they published an article showing the double helix structure of DNA. And what we've got here are those A's and C's and T's and G's. And what Watson and Crick showed was that A always links with T and C always links with G. And this gives the double helix molecule of DNA its particular structure. And as they also said in their article that published in April, uh, it gives it a very important function. Because, because they're complementary strands, if you unravel it, then you can copy it quite straightforward. And they have this rather coy phrase, which is very well known. It has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we've postulated between the bases immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. And they were pretty pleased about that. And it was the thing that Watson, in particular, had been obsessed with. How did DNA copy itself? But to be honest, that's not the most interesting thing about DNA, because obviously crystals can copy themselves. They're molecules that can replicate themselves in strange ways, but they don't do anything interesting. Genes and DNA are much, much more interesting. And that was the topic of the second article that Watson and Crick wrote uh, in May 1953, an article that Jim Watson wasn't particularly interested in. He thought it was a bit kind of over the top. Crick wanted to write it, so they published it. And this is the article, The Genetical Implications of the Structure of Deoxyribonucleic Acid. And it's this sentence we've got at the end that is actually, for me, the beginning of modern biology. Their hypothesis is that the precise sequence of the bases is the code which carries the genetical information. Nothing like that had ever been said before. It looks quite obvious to those you are biologists. It makes perfect sense. Everybody knows that. You teach it at, probably teach it at GCSE. It's obvious. And yet, these two people came up with something that was not at all obvious. They took various ideas, and they came up with something which was both immediately clear to people and a very radical hypothesis. So let's look at it again. It's the sequence of bases that is the code that carries the information. I'm going to look at each of those three things, sequence, code, and information, very briefly, and show you where the ideas came from and how Watson and Crick put them together. And then we'll look at what came after that great breakthrough. So first thing, the idea of sequence. Until the 1940s, People were still arguing, in fact, whether genes were physical things. There were a lot of people who thought that maybe genes weren't an actual thing. They weren't a particle. Perhaps they were the amount of something. So there was a lot of arguments about what exactly genes might be made of. And eventually, people became increasingly convinced that they probably were made of something, and they decided that they were made, almost certainly, of proteins. And the reason for that was when they crystallized a particular virus, the tobacco mosaic virus, it was made of protein. And therefore, people were quite convinced that proteins, with their infinite variety, must be producing the infinite effects of uh, what uh, genes can do. And this makes sense as well, because we knew that genes are on chromosomes, and chromosomes are made of proteins, and also of this very boring stuff called DNA, which most people thought was just some kind of structural component and completely irrelevant. This man 
had a rather different idea. This man's Oswald Avery, and he's one of the great unsung heroes, or certainly as far as the public's concerned, unsung heroes of biology. Avery was a uh, bacteriologist, and he worked on pneumonia. And he spent his entire life trying to understand uh, the difference in various virulent strains. And what he had picked up on in the 1920s was that sometimes you had two strains of, uh, two strains of bacteria, pneumonia bacteria, and they could turn from being a, a, a viral and virulent form into being uh, a quite safe and non-virulent form. And he wanted to try and find out how that happened. If you put the two together on a plate, they would change from one to the other. He wanted to isolate what he called the transforming principle. And what he proved was that this transforming principle was made of DNA. And therefore, that not only he hypothesized, not only the transforming principle in bacteria, but all genes were made of DNA. And people didn't agree with this, and he was rather worried, because the problem was, with the relatively limited analytical techniques they had at the time, and the relatively few samples of DNA they had, when they looked at the structure of it, the components, they found those four bases we've had, A, C, T, and G, and they seemed to be there in basically the same numbers, same kind of levels. So it seemed, people argued, that DNA was made of these four components, and that was it. Probably it was just A, C, T, G, A, C, T, G. It was a tedious, very boring structural molecule. So one of the problems for Avery in getting his ideas incredibly widely accepted, a lot of people did accept them, but many people either said, well, you know, in fact, it's not really the DNA. You've got tiny amounts of protein in your samples. That's what's causing the effect. And anyway, if it is DNA, how could it do it? Because where's, where's the complexity? There is no complexity. It's boring. Now, as soon as Avery's ideas uh, results were known in 1944, some people did immediately accept his ideas. These three people, Joshua Lederberg in particular, was a 19-year-old who read the paper and immediately decided this is what he wanted to do. He abandoned medicine and turned to bacterial genetics, and within 15 years, he'd won the Nobel Prize. The other two people, Masson Gulland, was a DNA uh, chemist from the UK, and André Boivin was a French scientist who replicated Avery's results on other bacteria. And in 1947, at a meeting in Cold Spring Harbor in New York, all three of them suggested, well, maybe DNA is not so boring. Maybe it's something to do with the order in which those bases are presented, A, C, T, and G. So the idea that there might be some complexity, some hidden complexity in the DNA molecule was floating around. The idea that the sequence was significant was already in the air long before Watson and Crick. Now, how did the DNA molecule get discovered? As we know, it's Watson and Crick who did this fantastic work. It's worth just spending a moment because most of you, I guess, like me, think, well, double helix, it's just a kind of shape, and all they had to do was realize it was in a complicated shape, and that was it. In fact, it was much more difficult than that because as you can see from this model, it's very, very precise. The model is exactly showing the right distances and chemical angles, molecular angles, that each of the different atomic components would have to have and that's where the structure came from. They needed those numbers that showed the exact relationship of these molecules in order to be able to build their model. And indeed, for a long time, for several weeks, the model didn't work uh, because they had the metal plates the wrong way up. And if they turned the other way up, then it suddenly makes sense. Somebody in the lab pointed out, yeah, that's the wrong way around. So they were going completely up the wrong tree because although they were very incredibly smart, they sometimes didn't quite know about experimental detail. So where did they get their data from? Where did they get those numbers from? They got them from two places. Well, the same place, really. They got them from King's College, just down the road uh, on the Strand. They got them from the work of Morris Wilkins, who was a friend with, uh, of Crick. And indeed, his photo of X-ray diffraction images of DNA is what inspired Wilson, Watson to actually get involved uh, in the project in the first place and to start trying to understand the structure of DNA. And as you also know, they got their data from Rosalind Franklin. Now, these data weren't stolen, as some people suggest, and it wasn't the showing of a particular photo that made Watson's eyes bug out, although that's the way he tells the story. In fact, it's much more prosaic. Rosalind Franklin had been carrying out very careful molecular uh, studies of DNA and measuring those, providing those angles and those distances that Crick was going to use <coughs> later on. And it was published in an internal report, which was circulated. Eventually, a copy got to Watson and Crick, and that's how they found the numbers. But they were definitely Franklin's numbers. 
What's interesting about Franklin is that she was primarily interested in the technique, not in the molecule. Watson was absolutely obsessed with DNA as a phenomenon. Franklin had been previously worked on coal, and she'd been brought to King's to add special skills to their group. And for a while, she didn't really get that the structure they were looking for had to have something of the function of DNA, this ability to copy itself, but also this ability to represent vast different uh, kinds of uh, representation that could produce the different effects of genes. But what is very striking is that in the last weeks of the project, just as she was leaving, as she was kind of winding down, because she really did not get on with uh, Wilkins, and so she left to go uh, to, uh, to Birkbeck, she really came very, very close to cracking the problem on her own. Without the two kind of popping jays and geniuses in Cambridge, she was able to nearly get there on her own. She began to realise the significance. She too realised that perhaps the sequence of bases was going to be very, very important, and also began to... She was about a month away from getting to the double helix herself, but she was beaten to it by Watson and Crick. So that's for sequence. What about the idea of code? Again, the idea that genes contain a code is very, very banal to most of us. And yet, before, again, the 1940s, it's very interesting, there's this con you'll see each of these words, information, code, sequence, it's the 1940s that were decisive in developing these ideas. Code, the first person to talk about a genetic, well, a code, not a genetic code, was this man, Erwin Schrodinger, who you may or may not know. There's a joke there, but sorry. Uh, <laughs> Schrodinger had to give uh, public lectures in Dublin. Yeah, he escaped from Austria when the Nazis took over, and he was given a post in Dublin, and he had to give a, a, a public lecture. And he decided to talk about the latest biological research. It ended up being three lectures. They were so popular that he had to repeat them, and he later went on tour around Ireland giving these lectures, explaining it to, to, to the population. And basically, he's trying to, with his physicist side, trying to understand how biology works. And there are many interesting things in the book. It's still in print, uh, the book of his uh, lectures, well worth reading. But for our purposes, there are two things he comes up with. Firstly, just by thinking about it, if he says, well, if a, a gene is made of something, which he thinks it is, and it's almost certainly a protein, which is wrong, but still, it must be able to copy itself and it must be, have non-repetitive elements. It is what he called an aperiodic crystal. So it's a solid structure which can copy itself and which contains things that don't simply repeat themselves over and over again. There must be richness, complexity in there. The second thing he said was that it must contain what he called a code script. This is the first use of code in terms of genes. A miniature code. And it's not simply a plan, he says. It should also somehow contain the means to put it into operation. And that's what's significant about the genome. It's not a blueprint. It's not even a recipe book. It actually also contains the means to actually create itself, to actually put itself into practice. It's something much more rich than any of the kind of textual analogies which we normally use to try and explain what's in it. And Schrodinger, quite amazingly, got that at a time when many geneticists didn't do, and indeed many geneticists still really don't. Now, one thing that... Uh, Everybody, everybody who is anybody read, uh, read Schrodinger's book. And there's this delightful letter sent by Crick to uh, Schrodinger in August 1953, when he's about to pack up and go to, he's leaving Cambridge, he's going to New York. And he points out to Schrodinger that he and Watson had both read What Is Life and been inspired by it. And he sends him the two reprints, the two Nature articles, and says, we thought you'd be interested in the enclosed reprints, you will see that it looks as though your term aperiodic crystal is going to be a very apt one. And indeed, Schrodinger was absolutely right. Interestingly enough, if you say that to students today, they just look blank. If you tell them the DNA is an aperiodic crystal, it's like you're talking gobbledygook. So uh, Crick was right, Schrodinger put his finger on it, but the actual term has gone out of uh, disuse. Now, one term that Schrodinger did not use, and it's quite striking once you think about it, is that he doesn't talk about what's in a gene in terms of information. And yet, this is the most obvious thing to anybody who is not John Humphreys, that you can actually... That's a joke for those who are listening to the Today programme this morning. Um, that genes contain information. This idea is completely absent from uh, Schrodinger's 
book for the very simple reason that the idea had yet to be developed. It was being developed at the same, exactly the same time. So as Avery in New York is coming up with the idea that DNA uh, is a genetic material, and Schrodinger in Dublin is coming up with the idea of a code script, there are people in America, two people who are coming up with the idea of information as an abstract concept, something you can even quantify in certain circumstances. And these two people are Claude Shannon, who wrote, uh, worked on, on, inform on communication theory, and Norbert Wiener, who was a brilliant mathematician who was interested in control mechanisms. And they were both doing war work. Shannon was working on encryption. He also discussed with Turing about this. But they were both working on anti-aircraft guns. They were trying to build a better gun for shooting out an enemy plane out of the sky. So they, they had to work out calculations for trying to predict where the aeroplane would be and how all the soldiers who were firing the gun, spotting it, plotting the distance, firing it, how they were acting as well. And they came up with these various mathematical concepts during the war. They were published in various uh, documents. But after the war, they both wrote books. Um, Cannon, Shannon's book is still read today. It's pretty hard going unless you're a mathematician. But his calculations are used by all sorts of biologists today. Ecologists use Shannon's diversity index. I don't suppose any of them have any idea who Claude Shannon was, but his, uh, his maths is still used today by biologists to measure quantities of information. Wiener's book was a massive bestseller. Sh Shannon's book has remained merely an academic book. Wiener's book was a huge bestseller. It was a massive bestseller all over the world. The idea of cybernetics, as he called it, he coined this term, all those cyber words you use, they all come, come from Norbert Wiener, and it comes from the Greek for helmsman, for steering, because he's interested in control. And his, you can see the subtitle, Control and, the communica and Communication in the Animal and Machine. He's drawing parallels between animals, cells, machines. He even comes up with the idea that, you know what, we should be able to, if all organisms are information, then ultimately we can turn that into an electronic signal and transmit it across the ether. So Star Trek's uh, beaming down was devised, in fact, by Norbert Wiener uh, in 1948. He came up with the idea. And these books had a tremendous influence on public imagination. In 19, there were book artic popular articles published, loads of in the press, popular press and Scientific American and so on. In 1950, uh, Jay Z. Young, the biologist, gave the Reith lectures. Here they are in the listener. And uh, in the third lecture, I've highlighted all the times he used the word information. So this concept, which didn't exist six years earlier, hadn't escaped into the public domain, was now being used to explain the most simple things. It was so obvious, it was such a, an excellent way of explaining what was going on in genes, but also in the way that the brain processes information. And of course, when you start using terms like new terms arise, then there are always jokers who are going to take the mickey out of it. And this is a rather poor joke that appeared in Nature, uh, interestingly enough, the week before the Double Helix article, and it's signed by Jim Watson uh, and one of his pals, Boris Frussi, and a couple of other people, and they got all rather drunk in the Italian Alps in the summer of 1952, and decided they'd take the mickey out of those scientists like Lederberg, who were using these new terms, who were talking about information and cybernetics, and so they wrote this article letter, which is, to be honest, not funny. In fact, it's so unfunny that the editors didn't get the joke, and they published it, thinking, well, this is jolly interesting. <laughs> And this is the, the spoof, I mean, to be honest, yeah, you're not going to laugh at it, because um, it isn't funny, but they thought it was a, a great hoot, and Watson in his memoirs says he was intensely embarrassed when he suddenly realised that this was actually going to be published uh, a week before the really important paper, which was on the double helix structure of the DNA. Now, uh, bacteriologists realised that this was a joke, and you can find you know, scornful references to it in the literature, and then it was forgotten until historians suddenly got excited because they could see the words information, cybernetics, and then signed by Jim Watson. Now, it doesn't show, in fact, that Watson was taking this seriously. He didn't think that bacterial information was a, or cybernetics were useful. He was wrong, uh, but this was, in fact, a, a joke. But it does signify that these terms were actually in common use, and they were part of the zeitgeist, and that's where Crick picked them up and put them uh, into his story. 
So having published this book, this, sorry, published this, uh, published this article in Nature in which they talked about the, the sequence being important, effectively the question then was, well, how does it work? How does DNA work? How does it do what it does, which is effectively to code? We can now use that word because they've, it's now been put into the language. How does it code for proteins? And that's not something that Watson and Crick expected to answer. They weren't interested in it. They were going their separate ways. Crick was uh, going to Brooklyn Polytechnic on a, on a postdoc. He'd only just finished his uh, PhD. And Watson was going to Harvard to take up a post there. And they never, in fact, really worked together a, a, again after this time. And they weren't expecting to do anything. And then they got a letter, a very strange letter, from this man called George Gamow. George Gamow was a cosmologist, he was a drinker, he was a joker, he was a magician, quite a force of nature by all accounts. And he would regularly write people these very strange letters in very poor English, he was Russian origin, uh, and he would suddenly come up with these amazing ideas. And basically he wrote to uh, Watson and Crick saying, your article was very interesting, I've cracked the genetic code. And he came up with this idea, which was complete rubbish, absolute nonsense, because you can see here, involved actually DNA being directly the basis for the synthesis of proteins. Now, Crick knew this was rubbish because he knew that DNA was merely the basis. DNA had to be turned into RNA in ways that wasn't, weren't understood, and then the protein appeared. So Gamow's idea was completely wrong, but it made Crick sit up and take notice and think, OK, maybe we can think our way out of this problem. Maybe by just coming up with ideas, we can actually crack the problem. And they ended up creating what they call the RNA tie club. Um, and here we've got four of them. We've got Crick, and uh, this is Leslie Orgel, who's not playing the game. He hasn't got his tie on, uh, but he was a member. Uh, and this is Alex Rich, who di died the other, the other week. And this is Jim Watson. And they've each got an RNA tie on. And if you were noticing, you'd have seen that uh, Gamow had his RNA tie on as well. And there were 20 members. They're all blokes. It was a very blokey thing. Most of them were mathematicians and physicists. And there were 20 of them because there are 20 naturally occurring amino acids. And if DNA is coding for proteins, then effectively it must code for each, there must be some code for each amino acid as it's kind of put together on a string, which is a remarkably perceptive idea. So there are 20 of them, and they've even got their own tie pin, because they're each named after one of the amino acids. And on the tie pin, there's the three-letter abbreviation of uh, those, uh, that particular amino acid. Now, these, this, the RNA tie club never met together. All 20 of them never met together in the same room, which is probably a good idea, because it would have made the Bullingdon club look like bit butlins. Uh, because a, a Gamow was heavy going. This is a letter from uh, Watson, who wrote to Crick, that Gamow was here for four days, rather exhausting, as I do not live on whiskey. <laughs> and Watson wasn't a man who did, you know, he really enjoyed partying. So it was, it was pretty heavy going. But... It wasn't all fun and games. It meant they could actually circulate information, a bit like an email list today, or um, a blog where you could just come up with ideas and you didn't actually have to worry about it all necessarily being right. And so the, what they became obsessed by was what Crick called the magic number 20. And Crick said, in fact, it all took on the bit, the air of numerology. They had to get to 20. Whatever theoretical code these chaps had to come up with, the answer had to be 20, because there were 20 amino acids, so there had to be 20 things. I can't say the word some of you think I've got to say, because it hasn't been invented yet. There were 20 things, 20 units of the genetic code which could produce a particular, each one produce its own amino acid. That's what they were looking for. And they came up with loads and loads of ideas. They were all completely wrong. Absolute rubbish, virtually all of them. Brilliant, elegant, beautiful, but utterly, utterly wrong. It wasn't all wrong, however, because by doing some fairly simple maths that even I can understand, they actually came up with some fairly straightforward uh, barriers, frontiers to their problem. If you have four letters, A, C, T, and G, four bases, then if each base is a word, corresponds to an amino acid, then you can only have four amino acids, so that's no good. If you've got two bases as the unit co corresponding uh, to an amino acid, then you've got 16. Hmm, magic number 20. Okay, so we've got to have 64. We've got to have three bases, and then you end up with 64 combinations. That's okay. But then what are you going to do with the other 44? So people then got very called up and all tied up in all sorts of complicated ways of trying to get rid of the, uh, the other 44 combinations that they didn't need to come up with the magic number 20. 
The other thing that this group did, which was incredibly important, which is still absolutely fundamental, is this little diagram which Francis Crick drew uh, in 1957. It's what he called the central dogma. Now, it's not a dogma, it's a very unfortunate term, it's a hypothesis. And it explains what he called the flow of information. He said something very important. He said that life involves the flow of energy, the flow of matter, and the flow of information. And I think we've probably forgotten the first part of that phrase, energy, and that's what Nick is going to be talking a lot about uh, in his talk afterwards. But those three things, flow of energy, flow of matter, and flow of information, that's what life is. And what he's saying here is that information can go from DNA to RNA to protein, but it can't get back. There's no way that we know of, and this is still true, there's no way that once the information has got into a protein, that the protein can then somehow change your DNA sequence. There's no way of that happening. And when, what Crick meant by information wasn't, wasn't Shannon's complicated equations, it was simply the order of bases corresponded, he felt, to the order of protein, uh, amino acids. That was information. It was this sequential thing that was transferring into going from DNA into RNA into protein. So we're not dealing with maths here, we're dealing with metaphor, which is another thing that John Humphreys didn't get this morning. It's not something very, very precise you can measure. It's something abstract. It's this idea of genetic information as a metaphor for what's going on. That's really what Crick came up with, and that's the emphasis uh, that he was making here. So we've got all these clever people, clever physicists, clever mathematicians coming up with ideas. How was the code cracked? Well, not by any of them. It was cracked by two complete outsiders, two people who had nothing to do with any of the clever drinking parties or clever ideas, and that was actually significant. These people are uh, Marshall Nirenberg and Heinrich Matty. Nirenberg was an American, Matty was his German postdoc. And Nirenberg worked at the uh, National Institute of Arthritis and Metabolic Diseases. Now, that's very important, but it's not one of, it's not Harvard, it's not Cambridge, it's not Paris, it's not uh, Caltech, it's none of the pulsing hearts of molecular genetics in the 1950s. He was kind of off the beaten track. On the other hand, he happened to be down the corridor from some people who were making some unearthly compounds. And this was artificial RNA. RNA that was made in the laboratory with new techniques that had just been discovered. So he could actually go down the, down the corridor and borrow some of this artificial RNA. And he came up with the idea that if I can get a test tube mixture which can make proteins, so it's got all the gubbins from a cell, and I put in some artificial RNA, I can crack the code. And he came up with that idea all on, his, all on his own. Here's a little reconstruction from Scientific American of the key experiment. Now, the, R, the RNA he got hold of was all made of one base. He didn't know how long the molecule was. And it was all either AAAAAA or CCCCC or TTT or UUU. So in DNA and RNA have changed T and U. Uh, in RNA, you have U rather than T for reasons that I won't go into. So he had this UUUU stuff. And this was a stupid experiment because the RNA tie club folk had worked it out because in one of their calculations, trying to get rid of those 44 complicated units that kind of messed up the number 20, they said, well, any repetitive one that just had the same letter, that wouldn't count. So everybody agreed on that. So nobody did the experiment except for Marshall Nirenberg. And it worked. And what he showed was that what came out of his test tube was a, a protein basically made of one compound, one amino acid, phenylalanine. So with that single experiment in May 1961, he'd cracked the code. He'd shown, firstly, that you needed to do an experiment rather than just coming up with ideas. And secondly, that probably, but not definitely, probably three U's was the unit that coded for phenylalanine. So he was lucky. He happened to be in the right place at the right time. He could borrow this stuff. He was incredibly smart. And his status as an outsider actually helped him because he wasn't restricted by the ideas that the uh, RNA tie club had come up with. So he, this is all kept terribly secret. They knew it was a big deal, uh, very, very excited about it. And he goes to Moscow. Everybody who was anybody went to Moscow. Here we've got Crick, uh, Watson. I can't remember some of the other famous people in the front row as well. Moscow was the uh, Biochemical Congress in August 1961. And he gives, Nuremberg gives his talk to about 
20 people. This was, there were 5,000 people at this conference. It was immense. He gave it to about 20 people in a little hall. It must be said that the title of his talk was really boring. It wasn't, hey, folks, we cracked the genetic code. It's something really tedious. Unless you knew what he was getting at, you wouldn't have got it. And the talk's pretty dull, apart from the last few, uh, last few slides. So it made very little impression, except for one person who was in the audience, Matt Measelson, who'd been working uh, with Crick and Brenner and knew quite how amazing this was. And he went to get Crick and he said, look, there's this guy, we've never heard of him, but he's cracked the genetic code. You've got to get him on. And Crick was in charge of the, next, uh, the plenary session the next day, which was going to have about 1,000 people at it. And here is actual his conference notes uh, for Thursday, the August 15th. And you've seen he's got here Nirenberg. And he's going to put him on here after Measelson and Weigel uh, during the discussion. He didn't go over into the coffee, I noticed, which is good. And he was therefore going to put Nirenberg on. So Nirenberg was able to get up on stage, give his talk a second time. And from the reports of people who were in the audience, those, they were either just amazed at what this man had done. And those who, wanted, who thought they could do it immediately wanted to get out of Moscow straight away, get back to the lab and start doing it. There's stories about people sending telegrams to the lab. You must start doing this. And indeed, by the time Nuremberg got back and in action, a competing lab uh, in New York had already started replicating and developing his experiments. Now, everything wasn't over then. There were still big problems. The size of the codon, that's the word I wasn't allowed to say because it hadn't been invented. The size of the genetic unit, how many bases, uh, hadn't yet been proved to be uh, free, as it in fact is. And Crick more or less proved that, or it was a multiple of three he was able to show, by the end of 1961. Secondly, despite that, people carried on wondering about, well, maybe it's only two codons, or it, it wasn't just immediately everybody jumped on the bandwagon and accepted uh, what was going on. Still, still a lot of work to be done, and it took finally uh, a lot of very hard biochemistry, no more clever maths and physics, just some really hardcore biochemistry that was done in the mid-1960s. And by the end of 1967, the final word had been written, uh, and that was a UAG, which means stop, quite appreciatively. And this is what the uh, code means. Here we've got uh, the UUU, coding for phenylalanine, and here we've got uh, UAG coding for stop. Now, what Marshall uh, Nirenberg got was also uh, a Nobel Prize in the year afterwards, in 1968, and this is a banner that they put up in his uh, lab to celebrate. Very nice. Now, throughout this time, everybody had two key assumptions. Firstly, that the genetic code was universal, that all organisms shared it, and secondly, that there'd be a one-to-one -one relationship between the DNA sequence and the amino acid sequence, that you could read off a codon, amino acid, codon, amino acid. And everybody accepted these as working hypotheses. Within 10 years, they're both shown to be untrue. So the genetic code is not strictly universal. We all have two. You've got one in your main uh, nuclear DNA, and then your mitochondria, which Nick will be speaking about, use a slightly different genetic code. Similarly, your DNA is not collinear with your proteins. Your DNA sequences are interspersed with big stretches of who knows what. There's a big argument as to whether it's junk or it's significant. But genes are, in fact, in pieces. And your DNA has to be, your RNA that's produced from your DNA has to be snipped apart and stuck together so you do get the collinearity. These exceptions, which are very irritating, uh, don't actually matter. We can explain them in terms of natural selection uh, and evolution. But it's just interesting that the basis, if people had started working with mammalian genes, which are so complicated, they'd never have got anywhere. They needed to use these very simple systems like bacteria and viruses. And they, above all, these facts do not contradict our, the key assumption, both of these people and our knowledge today, that we all share, all forms of life on Earth share a common ancestor. Now, this doesn't tell us about the origin of life. Nick's going to talk about this. The DNA code does not tell us about the origin of life because it only tells us about protein-based life, like ours. And as far as we know, we suspect that before that, there was another form of life, which, as far as we know, no longer exists, but who knows what lives in the ocean depths, that there was a form of life using simply RNA or maybe peptides to reproduce itself. And in this situation, there was no code because the RNA was actually doing, directly doing the enzyme, enzyme uh, reactions, was carrying out the intervention on the environment that we now use proteins to do. 
Why did DNA life survive and flourish and outcompete RNA life? Probably because it's much faster, and above all, because proteins are much more varied. They're infinitely varied. We can build bodies of all sorts of amazing forms with them. If we were just made of RNA or of peptides, it would be much more difficult to really build much at all. So where did the genetic code come from? Right, well, I'll give you a very short answer, we don't know. Okay, and all the best questions in science are, we don't know. There's a lot of argument about, we don't know. But uh, you can sense what's going on. Look at the code. Here, well, this is why it's a problem. This is why those physicists were wrong. We've got two uh, amino acids that are coded by six codons. This one, leucine, and this one, arginine. Six codons. So tremendous, what we now call redundancy. They, at the time, the 60s, called degeneracy. So the code is degenerate. There are lots of different examples that will produce you leucine. Similarly, there is one codon that codes for methionine, and it's also, if it's at the beginning of the sequence, it says start. That's kind of odd. And there's another one with just an amino acid with just one, uh, just one codon. If you look at the second, either U or C, then the final codon, sorry, U, its final position, U or C, then all codons that end in U and C code for the same thing. So that looks kind of... This is why they all went a bit mad, because you look at it and you can start to see patterns. But the patterns, what, they are, where, what the patterns really are, we don't know. And it gets worse, because all these amino acids in this part are all what are called hydrophobic. They don't like water. This group are very acidic. So it looks incredibly tempting. There must be some kind of logic or order to the code. But for the moment, we don't know what it is. Crick kind of gave up, and he said, well, it's a frozen accident. And he pointed out, above all, that the actual code could not have been predicted. It is so crazy that nobody could have come up with that. And that's telling us something very important about biology. Natural selection produces things that work, but they are often extremely inelegant. You only have to look at a human skeleton to see all the bits all over it. And they haven't, it hasn't been designed by anybody. As, as uh, Jacob put it, evolution doesn't design, it tinkers, it gets what there is and adds to it. And this is probably why the genetic code is this mixture of rational, perhaps some kind of structural or chemical reaction explaining it, and then there's this other stuff which we can't quite explain. Biology, unlike physics or maths, is messy, and that's essentially what we have to deal with. So to summarise what we've got here is we've got, I've been talking about code and information. And these are analogies or metaphors. They're not precise mathematical ideas. And they're metaphors because organisms aren't computers or machines. And the genetic code isn't actually a code. It's simply a way that chemical reactions take place inside our cells. It's metaphor, not maths. The lessons of all this for those of us as scientists are stupid experiments, can be vital, unfortunately, and generally in my hands, they're just stupid. But they can be really important. Theory is important, but no matter how elegant a theory, you need a proof. You need an experimental proof of it. And experiments are uh, generally what biology uh, deals in. In terms of thinking about the future, metaphors, all our metaphors flow from technology. Currently, our highest form of uh, technology is the computer. So everything we talk about is a computer. Brain's a computer. Well, it's not. You know, cells are little mini-machine computers. Well, they're not. But that's the best we've got to try and express this very complex form. So in the future, what will happen? When we've got new forms of technology, will we re-look at what we've discovered and think, you know what, that's just wrong. The, the cells aren't computers, they are whatever, they're some other form of technology. Or will it enable us to discover new things which currently we cannot begin to try and address, like consciousness? Is there a way of new technology providing us with an insight? That's going to be decided in the future. Because the last word is this. Stop. <laughs> What is the symbiotic relationship the two organisms have that allows them to be symbionts?